Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us again another Wednesday. This time, we will continue our discussions on Objectivist Essays. And today's essay is Gold and Economic Freedom. And its author is Darth Vader, or as some other people call him, <laughs> Alan Winsman. Um, uh, but let me start, since we're in the UK, um, you can see the two pound um, coin, and it has a, an homage to the person who instituted the uh, gold standard as it was known in the 19th century. If you want to know what the homage is and who that person is, please feel free to ask that, that question in Super Chat. I'll be, be glad to answer that. Uh, so to discuss this essay, we have James Valiant, He's the author of Creating Christ and the Passion of Fine Rights Critics. And um, okay, let's start right away. Um, so James, well, I think- Just initially, I'd like to say that I am not a professional economist. I studied as a minor at New York University economics where I had some really excellent economics professors, Austrians like uh, Israel Kirzner and Larry White and, and uh, Mario Rizzo but I am by no means a professional economist, but I don't think that the fundamental answers here lie in economics, but in philosophy and ethics. So, and history, which I am a student of as well. But with that proviso, proviso I'm happy to discuss this article. I agree, and I will try to make the questions a little, little bit less on the economic side and more on the moral and political side. Okay. Um, and first of all, that question is related to that. And what is the relationship between gold and economic freedom? Well, there's really two ways I can answer that. A simpler answer and a more complex answer that does involve economics. The simpler answer is, what is the relationship between theft and plunder and economic freedom? Ultimately, it's the same issue. Uh, gold is honest money. Uh, we ask ourselves what makes a private counterfeiter, counterfeiter wrong. Well, he's engaged in a kind of theft, isn't he? He's just printing money in his basement and sending it out there as if it's real money and it's pure theft. He's not offering any real value for even the security that the Federal Reserve or the National Bank is offering on the currency. So everything that makes private counterfeiting a kind of theft makes it theft and plunder when government does it. Only worse, it's on a legalized, systematic, vast scale, in which is perfectly permissible to play with the value of money and thus affect people's savings. But ultimately, that's the answer. It's a, in effect a form of theft. And uh, uh, freedom is the opposite of such coercive activities as theft. A free society, a capitalist society, ban legally bans such, such theft and plunder. But uh, the more complex answer here, it, we have to understand the role of money. Uh, once upon a time, before people had a common means of exchange, you know, a single commodity, which would be accepted as a common uh, uh, medium of exchange for just about every other good in the economy, uh, the, you're limited to barter. And if it's me trading my chickens that I grow for you, trading the grain that you grow, the division of labor, the amount of specialization, the increases in productivity that that brings about is severely limited. And so money was a great revolution. It expanded uh, the capacity of the economy to go beyond barter. And more than that, it created the capacity for the expansion of credit, which can help the expansion of the economy. Money plays a critical role in that. It was not a discovery of government. It does not get, need government to exist. People need simply to voluntarily choose the single commodity, which is the most marketable and the most useful in this context, to serve as a yardstick against which we can, an objective yardstick against we can uh, evaluate the relative values of all the goods and services in the economy vis-a-vis -vis this one standard. Because it has, because of gold's unique qualities, its durability, its fungibility and so forth, its relatively high unit value, it, and at the bottom line, those qualities make gold the single most marketable commodity in the world, the, co the single commodity people are most willing to trade for any other. This makes it the, the objective money. It, and if money is not a form of commodity, it is not pegged to a specific commodity, then what we have is some distortion necessarily entering into the system uh, the yardstick itself is being played with 
the, the measuring rod itself is being played with if we can distort money through the use of paper currency. Now in history, it began much, much earlier and much more simply. Say in ancient Rome, they used gold and silver and the government understood that in order to raise money without raising taxes, all it needed to do was to debase the currency. It could put other metals into the silver coins. It could reduce the amount of gold in the gold coins. And this was known as debasement. Even to get away with that, the Roman government, for example, had to take control of all the gold and silver mines. Literally, if they found any significant gold or silver deposit anywhere in their empire, the government would take control of it so that it would have control because legal tender laws, they realized in that ancient context were not gonna be that effective. Governments seized control of the sources of precious metal and were capable then of debasing the currency. And the process of debasing the currency, what they have done is devalued money in relation to all the other commodities. If you're the first person to spend that debased currency, you get the prices before the effect of the debased currency has had effect to, an effect of rippling out on the rest of the economy. So the government gets to spend the new funny money on the old prices. But as the effect of all this new money ripples out in the economy, prices will tend to go up. And the last guy to spend that new debased currency is screwed, in effect, because he's got the high prices uh, with the debased currency. That's a simple example. When we enter the modern world with paper funding money, well, then the government has basically an unlimited capacity to fund their own debts by simply buying their own bonds with money they create from thin air. The basic theory is that the more money you have, if you can artificially inflate the amount of the money, then you've got more money chasing fewer goods. And this will, it in the long run will tend to increase the price of those goods. Now, it's not an automatic thing. The timing of that, how that happens can uh, vary depending on the context. For example, increases in productivity can sort of delay the effect of the full inflationary effect. Of course, it still depends on people's willingness to pay the higher price of any specific commodity. But whether it results in immediate price inflation those monetary inflation or not, it necessarily has the impact of eating savings, eating the seed corn, devaluing people's savings at the expense of borrowing. You'd be a fool to put money in a savings account. Well, take today, for example, with zero interest rates. <laughs> you get nothing for saving or less than nothing for savings if there's inflation because the value of the savings goes down with inflation and you're not getting any interest to compensate for it. You'd be a fool today in zero interest rates to have your money in a savings account. That necessarily discourages savings and encourages the consumption in effect of all savings and investment, all of the seed corn, which will, which will in fact be the fuel for future growth. James, I have a question related uh, related to one of the things that you did to the be in the beginning, and I am asking you as an historian, and one and that is related to people in MMT, modern monetary theory, usually claim that money gains its value just because the government declares that that it has value, uh, but historically, I think it's very different. Could you comment a bit on that, and maybe a bit on why salt? And even tobacco has been used as means of exchange. Well, sure. I mean, you know, the ancient Roman government used to pay their soldiers, at least for a time, in salt. Salt was so valuable a commodity, even though it's a completely consumable and disposable commodity that gets used up, uh, it, salt was used as a commodity. Uh, cigarettes during World War II, American soldiers would come to Europe, which of course was in a desperate state in, in World War II and actually use American cigarette, American GIs would use American cigarettes as currency in, in, in France and Italy. Um, uh, but of course they're ultimately the most consumable thing you can have. Those don't tend to work as money precisely because they are an immediately consumable item. The, the, one of the qualities that the commodity uh, that our commodity money should have is a durability so that there can be an enduring value of it through the through a process it's not immediately it need not be immediately consumed it doesn't go bad it doesn't rot it doesn't get stale like cigarettes over time 
So there are certain features that make gold the single most marketable uh, uh, commodity, the commodity that people are most willing to exchange in exchange for anything else. And that has to do with its durability, its uh, high unit value, its fungibility, certain physical features about gold, um, its luxury value, which suggests a high level of uh, value per unit, which really helps it be uh, the most marketable commodity. Thank you. So my next question is, could we talk a bit on why the defenders of free markets are not that interested in defending gold? I, there are some, especially the Austrians, but there are other uh, defenders that are, aren't that keen on, on defending gold. Could you come oh, yeah. in some way? Oh yeah, our Milton Friedman, Chicago school, monetarist type economists uh, really do want the government to be able to have their finger on the control of the relative value of money. Why? They want to get away with certain government programs. Milton Friedman himself is in principle not against some kind of welfare state or minimal income. In order to generate the kind of income that the government needs to engage in a wide-scale welfare program, a welfare program that even people like Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize economist who's so associated with the defense of free market, want it, is because they really do think government can, do, A, do a better job at managing the business cycle, and two, they actually do believe in certain projects of the welfare state, which can really be only funded. Taxes, people will allow taxes to go up only so much before they kick the politicians out. So the government has to look for another way of raising revenue. And the most insidious way of raising revenue, as I say, is the capacity to buy their own debt using money they've created from nowhere. Um, the next question is, could you make a distinction between the economic adv advocacy of gold, um, for instance, because it's efficient, because as, as you have said, it's durable, et cetera, et cetera, against its moral and political advocacy. Um, and, and I'm asking mainly because when I was starting to, to read Ayn Rand, some of my friends that were also reading her, were skeptical or of the economic argument, but they kind of saw what the more. But in while they were seeing that, they, they thought it was. Uh, they didn't take into account the moral argument. Could you comment a bit on the difference between both, and a bit more? Uh, you you already mentioned it, but on the more moral and political. Well, right. I mean, in effect, a counterfeiter is stealing. It is no conceptually different when a government central bank does it. It's theft. It's theft in relation to savers as against borrowers. If the value of my dollar is going to be worth less five, 10 years from now, I'm going to get a, a big fat loan because the money that I pay back is going to be less in actual value. If on the other hand, I'm a saver and 10 years from now, the money isn't going to be worth the same, I'm a fool. Because if the interest rate doesn't keep pace with that inflation, I'm behind the eight ball, not ahead of it. My steel, my savings, in effect, are being looted, are being looted for the government's purposes. And there's no other way of looking at that. It's a com it's a little secondhand complex transaction, but it's in effect a form of plunder and theft. And that is the fundamental moral reason why the Federal Reserve and government money is immoral, because it affects the actual story. See, Ayn Rand understood that not only does money provide a, a medium of exchange, an objective medium of exchange, it also provides an enduring way of saving, of holding value. That function is destroyed. The ability of savings and investment is undercut as such. And the value of your savings has been altered, has been altered through nothing that you've done on your own. It's a form of theft. Now, you can argue the economics of it and say, look, at the end of the day, this inflation must necessarily create bubbles that must come to a, must be burst. And these this uh, business cycle is going to be much bigger. You're necessarily gonna be creating economic bubbles, dot-com bubbles, real estate bubbles. Uh, today, people are buying all kinds of things. I don't know, Bitcoin on loan. Now, I don't wanna 
get into investment advice, which I think is a separate matter. But the point is that if all these investments are funded by debt, then what is happening is these debtors are being subsidized by the government, and the government's the biggest debtor, of course. So they're being the big, they're getting the biggest advantage of it at the expense of anyone who's actually attempting to save and to invest. And that savings is actually the source of investment, the source of future productivity gains and growth. So in the long run, it's a suicidal policy economically, but ultimately because it is a form of theft immorally in the first instance, when you have altered the yardstick by which we measure prices, then what you've engaged in is a kind of theft. At the same time, it doesn't mean that either Mr. Greenspan or Ms. Rand were advocating of uh, establishing a gold standard via political mandate, right? Not necessarily. Sure. I've been tempted myself to think that the law should simply say, should simply define the dollar as a, uh, a weight of gold and leave it at that. That strikes me as something tempting because it's a form of uh, anti-fraud law. Just as we have laws against the counterfeiting and fraud, perhaps we should define uh, the dollar, the dollar that the government accepts at least, as a weight of gold. Now that much I think they can do. Now to impose on everyone else, the medium of exchange they will accept in a private transaction, I don't think Rand would advocate. She advocates free banking and a free market in money, uh, not a government imposition of that money. And that would imply if there is, uh, let's say, there, if there is this thing that they are calling, uh, there is going to be a space mining and suddenly gold becomes not, not that scarce, but let's say platinum becomes as gold it could be changed from gold standard to platinum standard right it, the physical characteristics that gold happens to possess which make it the most marketable commodity in this context the factual context might change and that is why there needs to be free market flexibility uh on these matters and another related um question is i think I've met some objectivists who say, you know, the best investment is buying gold. Do you think that this um, this essay is implying that? No, 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 no. I would want to make a huge distinction between uh, professional investing and uh, ec the economics and morality here. They're two distinct things. If, if, for example, you think you can make a killing in real estate when it's still hot or the dot-com bubble when it's still hot, I would urge you to take care because those bubbles may are gonna burst someday. Or if today you are making a killing, say in uh, cryptocurrencies, I'm not, gonna inter I'm not gonna tell you you're being foolish. You might time it perfectly, I don't know. But investment advice is one thing. The morality and economics of money is another. I agree. So the next questions are more historical. And I think the core one, it's what everyone would start talking about whenever you talk about gold. And it, and that is, if gold causes a great recession, what do you <laughs> think, James? <laughs> <laughs> that idea has been stomped on thoroughly by good economists. It is absolutely the opposite. You know, in my country uh, uh, in 1914 imposed the Federal Reserve System for the first time. And the idea behind the Federal Reserve System was to get rid of the occasional crashes that would happen over the previous century uh, in the American economy. Now, they were usually very short lived and they were usually due to some uh, either some regional or industrial crisis or far more commonly, and many economists have demonstrated this, from the panic of 1819, 1819 all the way up to World War I, all of these little crashes, short-lived though they may have been, were the result primarily of some kind of government intervention in the economy, government subsidization of railroads, government subsidization of certain industries or, or areas. Those would result in crashes. Uh, so. Government, government itself was responsible for these mini crashes that would happen during the 19th century. Now, to eliminate 
this business cycle and these these minor crashes that was short-lived crashes that would happen the federal reserve came along and said ah well we can smooth out the business cycle and fix it all well just the opposite happened since the advent of uh, the Federal Reserve, the business cycle has gotten a much more dramatic roller coaster, and the depressions have lasted longer, the inflations have come into being and lasted longer. So the business cycle has been put on steroids by the Federal Reserve System, and it did nothing to correct the boom bust cycle as such. No, gold was not the responsible uh, party in what happened in the late 1920s. It was, in fact, for example, <clears throat> the United States government expanded credit in the late 1970s in the hope of forestalling a, a worse uh, uh, slowdown than happened in 1927. Uh, we were also concerned, Britain was also concerned because of course it wasn't letting interest rates rise. And so gold species was fleeing the Bank of London. And so in order to help England, we came in to help intervene. Only made matters worse. We're going back and forth off of some kind of gold standard was totally chaotic at that time and only aggravated the problem but the expansion of credit in the united states did have a did help cause a speculative boom in uh, the equities market so that people were borrowing on margin to buy relatively speculative stocks this party came to an end and confidence was lost in the american economy and the liquidation of all those bad investments caused a, a chain reaction collapse in the American uh, stock market, which of course had ripple effects across the world, causing a Great Depression. In the United States, we attempted to uh, fix that through the, goal, through the uh, uh, New Deal programs, government works projects, more government spending and stuff that had zero effect on stimulate, all this government stimulus had zero effect on stimulating the economy. And years later, we had about the same amount of unemployment in the United States as we did when the depression started. I, a couple of years ago, I read um, Milton Friedman's account of the Great Recession. It, it was part of his economic history uh, oh, books. Really a monumental. Uh, 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 he and another woman wrote a monumental monetary history of the United States. Yes. And, and I mean, they, they were the whole, and there's a small book about just the Great Depression. And I read that one, <laughs> not the whole book. <laughs> You know, I'm a big fan of the anarchist Murray Rothbard for many reasons. He lied about his relationship with Ayn Rand and so forth. And I disagree with his anarchism. I even disagree with some technical issues in economics. But he really wrote a, a marvelous book uh, on America's Great Depression, titled just that, America's Great Depression. Um, and he wrote another marvelous book, The Panic of 1819, which showed that uh, America's uh, crashes were the result of government intervention in this in the economy as early as 1819 so yeah i i was going to more than it was more like a critique to friedman's in the sense in to friedman yeah. because i i didn't read the rest of the book so it, this critique might be a bit biased but he says something like well the the fed didn't act properly they didn't want to expand monetary they didn't, didn't want to resort to monetary expansion so they were wrong and there was this uh, new york central banker who did want to expand and and they didn't uh make any advance on his advice but at the same time he isn't taking into account what happened before and basically they they had been expanding and i think one of the reasons why the fed didn't want to further expand was because they they thought that, that it had happened a lot of bad things before I mean, he doesn't yeah. say that precisely correct precisely correct it was the previous phony the funny money expansion that created the problem in the first place and that did uh cause the fed in the 1930s to be a bit shy and people were a lot of people said well gee you should have been expanding credit a whole lot more and that would have got us out of the depression that's not clear at all if it did have any effect of kicking us out of a depression, it would only set up the next depression by, by creating uh, inflation. It's a strange thing 
when someone comes along and says, like Friedman, and comes along and says, well, you know, government expanding the money supply almost always tends to increase the, the price level, and we have a business, business cycles off and running. And there he is in the 1930s saying, well, of course, if the government could have been fine tuning the money supply, they could have flooded more, much more credit in the 1930s and pulled us out of the depression earlier. A, that's not clear that that would have happened. And B, if it had any effect to that, in that regard, it would have created all kinds of malinvestment that would have created a bubble that would have needed to be burst at some later point. And given that you mentioned already um, more Rothbard and many of like people like himself and many other Austrians advocate for something that is called uh, fractional reserve banking. And basically that what that means is that you cannot lend your deposits either. Th there are like hardcore who say that you cannot lend any sort of deposits that banks are merely uh, like a vault. And right. there are some that, that advocate for just some sort of deposits. Is Mr. Greenspan advocating for that kind of uh, reserve banking in this essay? Yes. Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan suggested in more than one place that they had no problem in principle with fractional reserve banking, unlike Professor Rothbard, who believed that any sort of fractional reserve banking would be an unwarranted expansion of credit in the system. And part of his argument was government's increase in the money supply has a multiplied effect through, through fractional reserve banking, and he's correct about that. Now, if I were just to store my gold in a warehouse someplace, surely it would be me who should be paying them for the security of holding my gold, right? Uh, but the only way, as a saver, I'm going to get a rate of interest, a return of some kind on my savings, is if the bank is able to have to loan out a good deal of the money it's collecting from savers and have only a certain percentage as their reserve. Now, so long as the customer, the guy who's putting his gold in the bank is aware of that fact, so long as it is disclosed to him, and in fact, in a free market, banks that engaged in fractional reserve banking would be eager to tell their customers their uh, reserve requirement. We, requ we only loan out this percentage and we keep this percentage in gold at, at all times. And we're going to give you a history of our, all, all, the success or failure of all of our big loans. There's going to be a huge encouragement for private banks to be frank with their customers about their reserve requirements, their previous success in loaning money out, especially the big loans. And those things are going to matter. In fact, the profitability of the bank itself will be an important bottom line as to whether I will put my savings into this fractional reserve bank. But so long as the bank is being honest, so long as the bank is telling you they're doing that, that not all the money that we're saving from people is always on hand. And so long as they're willing to tell you that we have a reserve requirement and this is our reserve requirement and the free market will encourage them to do just that <laughs> because banks will be competing with one another, uh, there's nothing in principle wrong or fraudulent with fractional reserve banking, but it has to be open and upfront that that's what's going on. Um, yes, I, I mean, this reminded me to uh, the Android Institute used to uh, invite George Selgin to his talks, to their talks. And I think I've learned so much from him. I think he's the greatest, one of the greatest economists alive today. I had the privilege of meeting George Selgin when I was attending NYU, as he was a student, a real student of economics under many of the same professors I was studying uh, from. And yes, he and my professor there, Larry White, are actually brilliant advocates of free banking and the free market in banking, which is the main protection for the consumer. Because remember, banks, just like any other company, are gonna have to be competing for their services. And one of the main services that a bank that engages in fractional reserve banking is, is giving you is security plus a rate of interest. And they've got to carefully monitor that or they're going to lose customers because they're in competition with other banks. Uh, Professor White, for example, uh, showed in one of his books the experience of free banking in Scotland, as temporary as that was, and the benevolent effects of that in history. Who would believe that freedom and Scotland could go together? <laughs> well, that, that, that was almost 300 years ago now, so... <laughs>
yeah, I, I, I really love his lectures and um, yes. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm my job, uh, my daytime job is to be a I, banking I, analyst. I, so. I don't regard either Professor Selger nor Professor White as objectivists. They're, they're sympathetic in many ways, but their economics on free banking is solid. I agree. And let's talk about another economist, and that's the author of the book. And I think, for me, the first time that I read this essay was seeing another world, because I, I hadn't seen anything like that. You don't get moral arguments for the gold standard, do yes. you, out of Ayn Rand, except for, from Ayn Rand. And and, and, yeah, and it was so genius. I, I was going through Eco 101, Eco 201, Eco 501, whatever, and so many models. And but it really is as simple as yes. the same thing that's wrong with private counterfeiting and why it's a crime applies to the government in spades because they're doing it in a legalized, systematic way. But it's still theft. It's still plunder. It's still robbing from savers at the expense of borrowers. Necessarily, you either have price inflation or you have a massive eating of the seed corn investment or both. That's the necessary outcome of manipulating the money supply. It's a kind of theft. And it, it I mean, if, even in the economic part of the, the essay, it has very nuanced and interesting concepts that were actually, I think, developed in the 1970s which were more or less known, but they weren't that developed. One of them were was the Sergeant uh, Impossible Trinity, which basically says that you cannot keep a fixed um, exchange rate, uh, monetary freedom, and uh, keep your reserves. Um, well, see, what happened? At the end of World War II, they created a sort of inflate. Yeah. Uh, it was an inflationary system in itself because it allowed governments to issue money and so forth. But there was at least an international constraint. A uh, heavy dependency on the dollar was encouraged, and the dollar was at least redeemable by foreign governments in gold. Richard Nixon ended this in the early 1970s, detaching even the uh, redeemability in gold uh, by foreign governments for the dollar. And this un, there was the final untethering of the US dollar from any gold limitations. Um, now, what was interesting is that they did this in response to the fact that gold, and once more, just as Britain was losing gold specie in the late 20s, so America was losing gold specie because it refused to see what was going on in America. We had just gone through Vietnam. We were still kind of going through Vietnam. The welfare state was expanding through Johnson's war on poverty, the development of Medicare, the giving all old people, in effect, medical uh, care. Um, and those were huge expansions in government spending. To get away with this expansion in government spending and the deficit spendings that were required, government needed to keep the interest rates low. But keeping interest rates low, or trying to at least, meant that foreign governments were now cashing out their, their dollars for gold. And to uh, stop the gold from leaving the country, Nixon said, we're stopping the conversion, the foreign conversion of dollars to gold. And that only if in Bretton Woods was pro-inflation, you can just imagine what doing that did. It actually completely untethered <coughs> the dollar from gold and created a system of floating exchange rates and a complete liberation of all the national banks of the world to inflate at will. Nixon also in 1971, uh, as another part of his new economic now get this he's a republican as part of his new economic policy in order to fight the inflation that Bretton woods had already created and government deficit spending had already created in this country to fight that inflation he imposed wage and price controls talk about economic ignorance this combination of things caused what many keynesian economists thought impossible stagflation it had been thought by some keynesians the famous phillips curve in which economic growth or, or employment is inversely related to inflation. Well, in the 1970s, for several years, we experienced what was known as stagflation, increasing unemployment, stagnating growth, and rising price inflation, despite the wage and price controls that Richard Nixon imposed in the 1970s, which were only causing specific shortages 
in uh, certain commodities. There were gas lines at the gas stations because, of course, you, you put a price cap on petroleum and you're just going to create shortages, as every economist knows. And inflation wasn't stopped until Paul Volcker was established in, as the leader of the Fed, who rose the, the interest rate. The Democrat, who, Jimmy yes. Carter, who appointed uh, the monetarist, who is much more sympathetic to the uh, Friedman type approach to things, uh, who slammed on the brakes of monetary expansion. He was he was trying to force interest rates up and stop government from buying so so many government bonds to increase the money supply, and that had the effect of driving interest rates through the roof. In this, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, things like mortgage interest rates by the late 1980s were in the double to 18, 20 percent. Uh, for, for my country, that's an outrageously high up mortgage interest rate. Uh, I, there were real estate agents I knew in the 80s who were saying, we'll never see single digit mortgage rates ever again in our lifetime. Uh, the lesson of that, that did drive out inflation, but at what expense? A giant recession. A giant recession. Um, there is no rational Fed policy. When you start manipulating the money supply, there is no objectivist recommended way of going about being a Fed chairman. Any decision, any decision, whether you're trying to tap down irrational exuberance, as Greenspan put it, <coughs> or trying to jazz the economy up by credit expansion, neither is rational. Both are going to harm people and make economic calculation all the more difficult. And that brings me to another question. And the guy who succeeded Greenspan, who succeeded Paul Volcker, was the author of this essay, who is, as I call him, Darth Vader. Um, yes, the longest serving chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in American history. And known because of the Greenspan put. It, it yep. isn't just because he was well, more or less. Oh, he, yeah, he did yeah. exactly the opposite. Oh, the whole thing is there were many times in which he actively encouraged the expansion of credit and money. The Greenspan put. Now, of course, did this in the long run help encourage the dot-com bubble? And at the end of the day, yeah, set into trend, the, eventually the real estate bubble? Yeah. Yeah, that's what expansion of government expansion of credit does. And what he would say if the if it looked like the expansion of credit was getting a little risky and iffy, well, there's too much irrational exuberance out there. The stock market's going crazy. Well, you, you can't jawbone it when you're in, you're in the midst of expanding the credit. So both his comments about, well, we need to juice up the through the Greenspan put, or we need to worry about irrational exuberance, both show the irrationality of Fed, the Fed as such. There is no rational Fed or honest Fed policy. It must mess up economic calculation in the economy and generate a business cycle. And with, with this kind of essay, which I think is super genius, how, can, how should we judge uh, Mr. Greenspan after all the comments that he said after the crisis, et cetera, et cetera? You know, after having read Mr. Greenspan's memoir, after having listened to, for example, the Senate hearings way back when Reagan did nominate him to be the Fed chairman, all I can say is that he really sold out. There's no doubt about it. He can say to himself, and he does, I think, as a rationalization, that I was doing the best that could be done given the fact that we had a Fed. We couldn't eliminate the Fed. So it would better to have someone in there who is managing it rationally. But of course, as I say, there really is no rational management of the money supply or, or the credit of the world credit availability. It can't be rationally managed. And Greenspan is actually a living example of that. Many of the comments he made really were disappointing. He still, admi he still claims to admire Ayn Rand. He still claims to admire the free market as the best solution. But he said that these kind of compromises were necessary. No, they were not. They did only serve to discredit the free market. And worse, by having Alan Greenspan, an advocate and friend of Ayn Rand's philosophy at one time, Alan Greenspan, a defender of the Austrian theory of business cycle at one time, to have him 
engaged in the Greenspan put or jawboning with comments like irrational exuberance only discredited free banking and gold all the more. Dr. Pichov, when his podcast once was asked about um, his views, I encourage people to see this, see that recording if they can. Um, we have a super chat question, which I don't completely understand. It's from Liren and it says, uh, oh, this guy also invited the hairdresser and got this guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Liren, I didn't completely get. I don't know what he means by the hairdresser. I, I, we will be tracking uh, the super, the, the, we will be tracking the chat on, on YouTube in case that you want to explain a bit more. I, I don't get your, your, the comment. Nor do I. Um, so I think I don't have a lot more things to say. Uh, I think we, we have covered everything and probably have one or two historical questions, but I don't know if you wanted to discuss something else um, that I we mean, haven't touched. Yet. The ultimate, the well, you know, Ayn Rand was asked in at, at her last public appearance, the sanct when she gave the speech, the sanction of the victims, she was asked specifically, a uh, really good question, what is the moral basis for the gold standard? And her specific answer is so clear and so revealing that it's really the bottom line here so that there is no way for the looters to get their hands on your money. Thank you. Oh, um, apparently it's a joke, but sorry, <laughs> I, I, referring to the super chat. Yeah. <laughs> joke, but uh, sorry, I, I still don't get the joke, sorry. Um, so I think maybe as an epilogue, we could talk a bit more uh, about, oh, Rassi says that if you Google James Valiant, you find a hairdresser from France. Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, if you do Google searches, you'll find uh, a distant cousin of mine who is a, a famous the, uh, clergyman in the United States, a James Stevens Valiant, who was a rector at the First Presbyterian Church in Baltimore. So, yeah, if you, you'll find other James Valiants. Uh, it's not an uncommon uh, uh, name, at least in some quarters, and they're not all me. <laughs> I'm certainly not a hairdresser from France. <laughs> sorry, that, that comment was from Lira, not, not um, Rassi. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yes, I also have uh, my name, it's apparently uh, of, um, of a Colombian singer. So whenever you search my name. <laughs> not to be confused with the singer. Yeah. Um, so I think I was wondering if we could make a smaller recount, like as an epilogue historically, on how the gold standard emerged. And that's why I pitched the super chat uh, question at the beginning, but apparently it wasn't asked. Um, but uh, in essence, the 19th century was landmarked by uh, the establishing of uh, the gold standard because of something that happened not actually in the 18th century, but rather, sorry, not in the 19th century, but something that happened at the end of the 17th century uh, with a guy that you may known him uh, because of his, uh, his contributions to physics, Isaac Newton. Basically, he was master of the coin and he introduced the gold standard parity as, as in the way that you um, said it james he basically what he did was establish a parity between the amount of money that uh the crown would pay in their debts uh to gold and and not only he did that but he also invented this little dance of, of the coins because people used to uh scratch the the base of the coins so that they could grab a little bit of gold and then put it into a, a coin uh, you know, by, by some sort of fraud. And in, uh, the, the two pound coin of, of the UK has uh, an homage to him because in the same dance, it says, standing in the shoulders of giants, which is one of his famous quotes. And, and I really like this coin and uh, yeah. it's amazing. And, and also 
has a representation of uh, the the way in which the industry has evolved fr first from um, agricultural state then to machines and then to computers oh that's great I, I that, it's, oh it's, wow that is <laughs> that is really a beautiful coin it is um, but yeah you're right see uh silver was always much easier to debase by governments than gold was it, they could use infiltrating metals and it was much more difficult to detect than with gold they're developed uh by the age of science uh good ways to assay a piece of gold to see its purity and so the the way people would have of doing it would be to scrape off some gold literally less gold content so that uh you could in effect, pass it off as worth as the same amount of gold. But even that has some limitations. But what's wonderful is that we're replacing silver with gold, which is easier to detect debasement on, and we're putting those little edges on it so that even a private debasement of the particular coin is less likely to happen. So there's a guy who's advocating honest money. A specific weight of gold is what we're talking about here, and we're not going to let you debase or play shenanigans with it uh so i really that history is a really wonderful one and people a lot of people don't realize that sir isaac newton was in charge of the british mint in the early 18th century he was um he did <laughs> many many <laughs> interesting things yeah um a Renaissance man yes yes and and you know by the time of adam smith and the classical economists an appreciation for the division of labor and the role of money was starting to emerge too and by the uh, uh, 19th century, you had some seriously smart economists, uh, uh, say, say, uh, uh, and then, of course, the later Austrians who really understood the function of money. Um, the, you know, a lot of people didn't even understand what the rate of interest was. Why should, you know, I give you $10 and you give me $10 back at a later date. Why should there be any rate of interest? And Mises understood, no, it's, it's the time preference. You know, money now is worth different to you than money later. It's the time preference that creates the interest rate, a perfectly objective thing. So it really was some basic mechanics about understanding the role of money and the division of labor and the effect of credit <coughs> that really allowed us by the 20th century, by the early 20th century and the work of Ludwig von Mises to uh, understand these issues much better. And of course, Ayn Rand herself uh, was uh, she read extensively uh, uh, Austrian econ economics um, and, and even some other economics, but she became a personal friend of the great Ludwig von Mises uh, when he came to America, and she became, and she was a friend of of Mises's great American expositor, the journalist Henry Hazlitt. Uh, both of them admired her. Uh, Henry Hazlitt, believe it or not, was the longtime economics editor for the New York Times back in the late 1930s and early 40s. What a different world that was, right? But Rand herself was a student and a friend of some of the uh, great monetary economists of her time, like Mises. Indeed. Um, and you mentioned the interest rates. And I, and I think one of the, the things that surprised me the most from this time that I reread the essay is that Mr. Greenspan realizes that banks not only have that ability of transferring money of allocating money but also of pushing businesses to be profitable and i think that's one of the things that, that is explaining why the economies have been so slow over the last 10 years because easy money is in source some sort of the opium of the banks totally 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 their whole standards all of their standards about lending all their standards about renewing loans that used to be, hey, what are your revenues? What are your profits? What's your business model? And the banks would look into that. <laughs> they weren't just going to loan out money. They wanted to make sure you had a decent business model. They wanted to make sure you had a record of paying back. And those things mattered to them. Uh, today, it doesn't matter so much, does it? And in fact, by having uh, it, look at our world today with zero or negative interest rates recently, I mean, the promiscuity is huge and the standards of lending go to the floor. Absolutely. Per force, by necessity. And as Mises said, it, inflate, monetary inflation isn't so much about overinvestment that needs to be cooled down, sort of the Keynesian way of looking at it, but malinvestment. 
investments that should never have been made in the first place, that will one day eventually need to be liquidated. A bubble burst. Yes. If someone in the audience is interested in seeing a bit more on that, I will recommend the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, which wouldn't be accounted as an orthodox economy. Uh, published a paper on uh, how zombie uh, companies have been surging over the last 10 years. Um, it's extraordinary, I must say, that someone like Alan Greenspan would have reached the highest levels. He was an economic advisor to Richard Nixon. He was the chief economic advisor to Gerald Ford when he was president. When Ronald Reagan came in, Ronald Reagan gave him high uh, uh, positions as economic. He was in charge of the Social Security Reform Commission before he became Fed chairman. Now, for a friend of Ayn Rand who, who had ever even advocated the gold standard to reach such heights in government policy is sort of noteworthy. And that only makes his betrayal all the more painful. He tried to make Social Security work by make, extending the, the uh, Ponzi pyramid scheme that it was out for a couple of decades, which is all he could have managed to do, of course. It's still our, our retirement system in America, government retirement system in America is still in chronic financial crisis. The Fed, as Fed chairman, all he did was to give his credibility to an inherently corrupt and plundering system. In in the book Ayn Rand Answers, I remember that she's asked what what is I think this is in Nick, in the Nixon years, and she's asked why is uh, Dr. Greenspan working uh, as an advisor to the government, and she is and she answers something like, I don't think that his uh, purpose is political, and uh, he he doesn't want to uh, enter into politics. He's just an advisor and as a temporary thing. Well, at first, his advice could be seen as simply advice, right? Richard, he would obviously be opposed to Richard Nixon's wage and price controls and, and Richard Nixon's, uh, uh, instead of going to more gold, getting us off gold even more. So the advice he was giving, probably in those early days, was sound. <clears throat> and if it's advice, it's advice. But once he becomes a policymaker and is imposing policies that are, in effect, throwing out a lifeline to inherently corrupt government policies like Social Security or the Federal Reserve System, then he's a sellout. Ayn Rand really didn't live all the way to see his complete sellout. Fortunately, I, that would have only been a further disappointment to her, I think. We have a super chat from Frederick, um, and he says, manager of central money, central authority, central religion, central God. What do you think? Well, you know, the Federal Reserve is often defended in a religious way. People assume that government has to be the source of money. People assume that without government, we couldn't have money. <laughs> there wouldn't be that the free market wouldn't generate a decision that gold is the best store. It wouldn't have a free, mar a free banking system, which would limit the expansion of credit, but also help expand it when proper. Um, no, people have no conception of free market money or free market banking. And so they simply assume, I think it's sort of a religious axiom that we need government to have money at all, which is of course, historic, ahistorical and economically doesn't even make sense. So. I, I remember my, when I was talking to my economist friends about this and I told them, you know, there shouldn't be any central banks. They, they were so triggered. <laughs> it's an assumption it, it is like a religious axiom isn't it it is it is um it, they they can't conceive anything else it, it reminded me actually you said god i um when i was um when i also was in a catholic school and somebody asked me why i didn't believe in god they didn't ask uh so uh what do you believe in it was what it was what <laughs> what what, what? <laughs> They're so disoriented, they can't yes. even conceive of options, right? <laughs> we have another uh, super chat from Liran again. Thank you very much. Uh, paper money is not an asset. It is a liability because it is constant, constantly debased. Here is uh, some debt of the government. Well, right? that's it. I would agree with that basically in principle. In fact, I'd go so far as to make a distinction 
these Federal Reserve notes that governments print aren't really money at all. They're just another promise, another form of credit. Money is something which extinguishes a debt, and a debt can only be extinguished with an actual value, a commodity. So I'm, in fact, I don't know if this is objectivism or not, but I've gotten so particular on the subject that I don't even regard this funny money currency as money. I'll give it the word currency, uh, but it's no better currency than a counterfeit bill would be, in my view. It's just a claim. It's just a promise on another promise, isn't it? It's not a commodity of value which can extinguish a debt for value. Yes, I think... Properly speaking, we, we don't have money in today's world. We have means of exchange, and the means of exchange is a very particular financial asset, which is different to uh, a real asset. Precisely. And because this is where the cryptocurrency thing comes from, right? Okay, we have a limited number of Bitcoin, and that's your only protection, is that a limited number have been uh, uh, issued so far. But what is Bitcoin? It's a promise on a promise. On a promise. I think it's actually Bitcoin. I think it would be classified more like, like a real asset. But at the same time, the difference between gold and Bitcoin is that Bitcoin, as such, doesn't have any different function except for being a, a Bitcoin. Right. Uh, How do we determine the value of Bitcoin vis a vis gold? In any objective way, I think it has a value in transactional. Uh, sure, but only in transaction, like U.S. currency notes. Yeah, I, yes, I, I am not a complete defender of Bitcoin. Ult ultimately, business. ultimately, an honest transaction is a value for a value, a commodity or service for a commodity or a service. That's an honest transaction. Here, I'm giving you something and you're giving me something else. Uh, here, if, even if I'm engaged in a debt, I'm extinguishing my debt with something real. I agree. Um, and although in, in the question, I would just say that money is a liability but of the government and it is an asset for us. Uh, some Austrians say that it is a non-asset, but I, I, I think I object to that. And the MMT also believes that it's a liability of the government. It is a liability of the government, but of course, someone else's liability can be treated as an asset by you. And in certain contexts, see, the whole thing depends upon the ability and the willingness of the economy to continue to accept that government's currency, isn't it? Some governments get into such crisis, you know, debt crisis or economic crisis, that the willingness to accept their currency falls to the floor, which dramatically affects its ability to treat, be treated as an asset. On the other hand, I, there are contexts in which government currency can be seen and used as an asset. Thank you. Does that make sense? It does, it does. See, um, I'm not an economist. I just look at these things from a philosopher, historian, a moralist's point of view. And I really think money can be under is it's most important to understand money from a moral standpoint that requires some understanding of economics of course but really the answer here is an ethical one not an economic one i agree what makes government uh currency wrong is the same thing that makes private counterfeiting fraud theft and plunder wrong i agree so i'm out of questions for today james uh, i don't know if you want something else to comment no your questions were outstanding uh, you're a real student of economics i can tell <laughs> well i that does my profession <laughs> thank you for that and you made thank it you. a really fun discussion i agree thank you thank you very much for the answers i hope my answers were clear thank you it, they, they were they were um so with that being said, I thank you again, James, for this series of amazing conversations. We'll be again uh, next Wednesday. And if people in the audience like this kind of uh, conversations, feel free to 
um, join to Ayn Rand Center UK, I think they have been putting the link below. <laughs> yeah, you can um, become a member from ten pounds a month. It's you get a whole bunch of perks for doing and there are, it. Yes. Yeah, and don't forget like, subscribe, hit those buttons too on YouTube. Exactly. Hit the bell. Thank you. Thank you.